I'm Francis Durnley, and this is a special episode of Ukraine, the latest. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Today is a bank holiday in the United Kingdom. So we pre-recorded an interview with one of our most requested guests, Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman of the Department of War Studies at King's College London. A world-renowned expert on international history and strategic theory, he is well known as a commentator on all manner of security issues and the author of many books, including, most recently, Command, The Politics of Military Operations from Korea to Ukraine. David sat down with him to discuss which country has the strategic initiative in this war, the ways the battlefront is likely to evolve over the coming months, and what experts have got right and wrong about the way the war has progressed. This is their conversation. Well, thank you so much for your time. Let's start with quite a broad question then. What's your view on the state of the front lines, the state of the war in May 2024? I don't think the war's quite at a turning point. The Russians have had the initiative for about six months now. They've done a certain amount with this initiative. They've made progress in the Donbass, more than the Ukrainians would have liked, perhaps less than they anticipated. And they've still got the initiative. And it's going to take time before the new kit and the new ammunition that the Ukrainians are getting from the Europeans and the Americans come through, although the fact that it is coming through allows them to use their stocks more rapidly than they might otherwise have done. But it'll take time, I think, for them to turn that around. They're they're clearly uh, hampered by limitations on air defence. The air defence is still pretty successful, but not successful enough. Uh, And the loss of electricity transmission the other day is one indication of that. So they've they've done stuff. The success in the Black Sea is always worth noting. And the attacks on oil refineries is strategic, systematic, bothersome to Russia. Not decisive, but, but it's not unimportant either. So the Russians have still got the advantage, but maybe haven't done as much with it as was expected. And we'll see how they go over the coming weeks, months, when they still have an advantage. I think the problem for both is keeping the the war going. The Russian economy is now flat out on a war footing. But there's little spare capacity, and I think they're peaking in terms of their ability to keep the front line supplied. And 2025 could be more difficult. Ukraine is clearly very dependent upon its European and American supporters. They've come through eventually, the Americans leaving it rather late. Will they carry on doing so next year? I think on the European side, probably. On the American side, it depends. I'm not even convinced if Trump wins that it it necessarily means the US gives up on Ukraine because a lot depends on the success or otherwise of his proposed peace plan. But As things stand, I think we're looking to a long war. There's no obvious basis for either side to make a decisive breakthrough. So the question is, at what point does one side decide that that the continuing effort isn't worth it? Uh, I don't see the Ukrainians ever deciding that. I think they'll carry on. And that means that you're essentially looking at decisions in the Kremlin maybe sometime next year. When you said earlier that the Russians, despite having the initiative for the past six months, haven't done as much with it as people maybe expected, could you go into that a little bit? Why not? I think their methodology is incredibly cumbersome. They've got the advantage of glide bombs now, and these batter the Ukrainian forward positions. And then they just send loads and loads of troops over and the Ukrainians can pick them off, and the, and the casualty levels are appalling. And even if the Ukrainian numbers are exaggerated, even if you halve them, there's still an awful lot of people getting killed. And then we've had the more recent images of the Russians advancing in sort of golf buggies and motorcycles and so on. So I think their, their operational tactics are 
pretty crude. And while they've clearly adapted very effectively in some areas, jamming their own drones and, and, and so on, it's, it's always unwise to underestimate them, or indeed underestimate the stoicism of ordinary Russian troops who keep on going in despite knowing what's likely to befall them. If they'd had a bit of manoeuvre capacity, you would have expected them to encircle and push on and break through and so on. Instead, you've had this hard grind of town or settlement, occasionally city after city, uh, which are left battered as a result, pretty useless. Now, the question of all of this is the gradually but suddenly a point that when an army breaks, it can break quite dramatically. We've seen one example of that in Kharkiv in, in September 2022. And there's always the risk that at some point the Ukrainians just can't hold. But they're doing withdrawals and they're slowly building up fortifications. So that's less likely than it might have been, but still a risk. There's a lot to get into there, but just to develop that last point, how important do you think the loss of Avdivka this year was for the Russians and for the Ukrainians. I had contacts describing it as saying the fall of Fortress Avdivka will be seen in the future as one of the turning points, and it was an awful defeat because of the implications. Well, it was important because the Russians have been trying to get it for a long time. You've got the series of cities, you know, starting with Mariupol, not Bakhmut, where you get these long, gruelling, attritional fights, and the Ukrainians know that that they'll probably have to abandon these places in the end, but not before they've taken out a lot of Russian capacity in the process. So it matters. I think it matters largely in the sense that I think Putin really wants to demonstrate he's got control of Donetsk and Luhansk, and this is an important step on doing so. Chasiv Yar, which they're going for at the moment, will give them more options should they take it, but people thought it would be already gone. So I think the problem they're getting to is when their own supply lines are too vulnerable. So you have to start thinking about abandoning much larger swathes of territory. You've got to remember this is a very big country and that a few kilometres doesn't necessarily make a lot of difference. But you do reach a point where if certain supply lines go, certain big cities start to form more rapidly, then I think there, there will be concern on the Ukrainian side. What are the signs that we should be looking for as observers to see either army starting to break? What are the, the telltale signs that a collapse could be imminent? I think the, the, the issue for the Ukrainians, which has been in a number of these battles, is at what point do you evacuate your troops? And I think that they don't always get it right. If you leave them there too long, then the attrition on your side is, is pretty grim and the, the morale effects are pretty grim. So you'll see the debates on the Ukrainian side I mean, in each of these battles. Although the Ukrainians don't tend to talk as much about their casualties and difficulties as they talk about Russian casualties and difficulties, the debate in, in, in the Ukrainian press and so on is, is pretty active. So you, you know where the pressure points are. And there's, there's always been this question of whether you just hold the line or, 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 or evacuate, if you leave the evacuation too late, as they have done in certain areas, then the costs are, are considerable. Moving away then and speaking a little bit about doctrine, do you see in this war in 2024, two years after the start, an, an evolution of something moving away from what we might call Soviet doctrine, or, but also crucially not NATO doctrine either? I mean, we, we, we've heard the reports, I've spoken to people who've talk quite actively about how NATO tactics, NATO strategy is either impossible in Ukraine because they don't have all the kit, but it's equally not appropriate because of reasons like, as Solution said, everybody can see everything. Both sides can see exactly what the other side is doing, which is not the case in NATO doctrine. How do you think fighting wars has changed? What have we seen? I mean, the Ukrainians have had to be innovative. They haven't had much choice. And, and the major innovations have come with drones which obviously suit the Ukrainians because they have limits on manpower. And, and the Russians obviously has also learned to, to use drones. And there's debates about who's, who's got more or uses them better. But I think on balance, I'd say the Ukrainians have been the more innovative, probably the more effective. But you know, don't discount what the Russians can do. The basic point, as he says, is there's a transparent battlefield. Very hard to do anything by stealth, 
it's easy to pick up what's going on. There's thousands of these things around all the time, literally at times. Uh, and they're, and they're exp- you know, expendable drones, but you also get the, the drones that have taken out Black Sea shipping or attacking oil refineries, which are, obviously have to be longer range and more sophisticated. So you've got a great range of these things. And, that, and that's an innovation. The, the Russians seem pretty stuck with Soviet tactics in which you just assume that you've got manpower and it's an expendable resource. And there are some on the Ukrainian side with that view too, because they would have the same Soviet training. But Ukraine clearly can't do that. Ukraine doesn't have air power. I think when people look back at the counteroffensive of last year, I think it was a NATO concept. And, it, you know, the, there are ways in which it might have succeeded. There the are ways in which it might have uh, succeeded, but it was quite a gamble. And the basic problem is when everything's in the open. How, how, how can you move quickly? when you can be seen so easily. And part of that is counter-battery fire, so that, so that you take out the enemy artillery, so even if they can see you, they can't do too much about it. But again, that also is not a straightforward thing to do. So I think you're left with this grinding sort of warfare in which either you, you, you do it the way the Russians do and just throw people at it, or you've got to do it with small company operations the way that the Ukrainians have tried to do it, in which what you're doing is small enough in a particular place that you can get away with it, and then you try and reinforce success. But it's slow, and I think that's what happened to the Ukrainian offensive. It's not that it was defeated as such, it just couldn't make quick progress. And the adaptions they had to make when they started walking into minefields and so on, just meant that it was never going to see the sort of dramatic, decisive breakthroughs that people imagine they're going to see with an offensive. So I think the, the, the net effect of the conditions of this war is just to slow everything down and means that a lot of the pressure points are going to be away from the battlefield. Do you think that slowing down that move to attritional warfare in all respects, do you think that inherently favours the Russian Federation with more men, more supplies, with, with more reliable allies? Manpower, the Russians are going to carry on having an advantage. There's no way around that. But they've gone through their equipment. And though the, their factories are producing more, a lot of it's refurbished stuff. There's just limits how far you can take it. So, as we're seeing, the quality of Russian equipment is not high. Now, you don't need amazingly sophisticated modern stuff to fire lots of artillery shells. And again, if you're prepared to accept the losses, sheer weight can get you a long way. So I think the, the attritional aspect of it is always going to be a problem for the Ukrainians. So it's a question of how well they adapt, which is why they put an awful lot of emphasis on needing better air defences, better counter-battery fire and so on. I, I think the Russians still have got a problem. Their professionals have been killed. They're promoting relatively junior officers into more senior roles because there isn't anybody else. A lot of their equipment is not performing well. It's true they get stuff from North Korea, but a lot of it's useless. I think there's always a danger just in looking at the sheer size of the Russian Federation, assuming in the end they're bound to do it out of sheer size, but they've wasted and squandered an awful lot of material. We're several months into Sersky's tenure as Commander-in-Chief, who obviously took over from Zeluzhny, who's been announced as the new ambassador to the UK. What do you make of his first few months? How do you think he differs to Zeluzhny strategically? Yeah, I mean, he's not as popular as Zeluzhny was. I mean, people know that the issues with Zeluzhny were in part political, in part, I think they were a reflection of the way that the last year's offensive went. He was the commander, it didn't work out as hoped. He'd, he'd made big calls on protecting fresh units to, for the offensive and building them up, and it was probably unrealistic in some respects. So there's a combination of issues there, and the fact that he's coming to the UK indicates he's, he's not been consigned quite to the outer darkness. He's, he's still seen to have a role. 
His successor is, I think, seen as more old-fashioned in, in his methodology. One of the problems that the Ukrainians have with mobilization is, is not, as far as I can tell, an unwillingness to fight, but an unwillingness to fight in hopeless conditions. And I think Chesney came with a difficult fight already underway. So he, he's been fighting a defensive battle. And you can't say he's been a great failure, but nor has he turned it round, and it would have been unrealistic to expect him to do so. So I think the, the, the real tests are yet to come. And there's a lot of innovation still going on on, on the Ukrainian side. You know, there are basic organisational challenges. There are basic problems which were evident last year about the ability to, to manage above quite small units, to, to command large operations, which they haven't been that great at. So there's a lot to do. And I think the general view that this year is one of blunting Russian attacks and then preparing for next year is correct. But it really does depend on how well they do the preparations, the delays in getting the mobilisation law passed which is now passed, indicates the system isn't wholly functional in Ukraine. You mentioned there that the, the pressure points coming down the track for the Ukrainian armed forces. In the next year, where do you see those? If you look at what the Russians say, which is the, the source of the pressure points, what are the Russian objectives? To, to protect Crimea, to take the annexed provinces, but particularly Donetsk and Luhansk, and if possible, to move on to take at least one more major city, of which Kharkiv is probably more realistic than Odessa or Kiev. Now, I think we're going to find the latter pretty hard. So I think the Russian imagination on this doesn't go much further than taking more territory, by whatever means, and making life miserable for Ukrainians by attacking infrastructure and so on. So the challenge for the Ukrainians is to hold on to territory and to protect infrastructure, which requires improving air defences. And so, in that sense, there's nothing new. I mean, the, the, this war has been going on for some time. I don't think there's short of weapons of mass destruction, which I don't think the, the Russians intend to use in, in Ukraine itself. The, 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 they haven't got a lot of exciting new options available. Certainly, it's going to have to be pretty imaginative by now because I haven't seen anybody else imagine them as yet. It's a grind for them, based on their assumption of superiority. And the Ukrainians have got to blunt it. The challenge for the Ukrainians is to find ways of hurting back. I think my view, which which is not by any means universal is that it's going to be very hard for the Ukrainians to win this war by breakthroughs on the ground. I mean, they can retake some territory, and hopefully they will. But you know, pushing the Russians out and getting them scrambling back across the border is quite a big ask. But they can create a sense of futility in Moscow. The, 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 what's the point of all of this? Where is it going? What have we turned ourselves into? The economy is booming at the moment because of high levels of military expenditure, but it's not productive expenditure. It's not investment into the long term of the economy. And while Putin feels, as he has done for most of this year, that he has the initiative, then they can be quite optimistic. But, it, but if it, having had their best chance when Congress was sitting on its hands and not doing anything and they haven't achieved very much, then you can see how doubts and, and concerns will start to grow again I, I, in Moscow. So I think there's a lot of hanging in there on, on the Ukrainian side and making things miserable. Just a sort of final point, I think Crimea is really important in this. The Donbass, to be frank, a lot of Ukrainians almost think it's a lost cause now, not least because it's been battered and tragically depopulated in many ways, not just by people leaving, but by people being killed. But Crimea clearly matters to Ukraine and it matters to Russia. And it's vulnerable. The Kerch Bridge is 
barely being used now. They've got a landline in the south, a supply line, which was the objective part of last year's offensive. So I suspect crime, Crimea will remain important, which will include regular attacks on Russian assets in Crimea. You mentioned in your answer there the use of weapons of mass destruction. Can we talk a little bit about the nuclear issue? Because it's something that every single time Medvedev uh, or Putin says something about nukes, the, we know, the press will report it, we will report it, because it's really scary and could change everything. What, what's your view on that? Yeah, Medvedev, he, he's become a court jester, sadly. Once is considered a serious politician. You look at what Putin says. Putin is actually quite cautious on the nuclear issue. He's absolutely consistent. The deterrent is there to stop NATO getting directly involved. And I think the fact that he has started talking about it a bit more recently is a reflection of the fact that they hoped that they could persuade Western countries to abandon Ukraine or at least severely cut back support. And they haven't really succeeded in that. I mean, you know, it's, the supporters of Ukraine don't think it's enough, but it's an, an awful lot more than the Russians would like to see. And then you've had the chatter from Macron and other Lithuanians and others that at some point maybe you're going to have to bolster Ukraine with, with Western forces in some way. And that is what Putin wants to deter. Whether he would actually use nuclear weapons in those circumstances, who knows? I mean, they tend to talk, even Medvedev, and sort of terrible things will happen. We do not know what they are yet, and so on. And so let people assume the worst. And the problem is that if Western forces do go into Ukraine, it won't be face-to-face -face fights with Russians. It'll be a training camp in Western Ukraine or something, because it makes more sense to train Ukrainians in Ukraine than bring them over to Western countries to get what often turns out to be pretty inappropriate training. So I think you could see some of that, and the Russians will have to work out what they do. I think they would certainly aim to attack any sites where Westerners were believed to be present in Ukraine. That would be the first deterrent. It would take a long time before you got to nuclear weapons, I think. And the, the, the nuclear arsenal matters a lot to Putin. I don't think he's going to put it at risk for a marginal tactical gain. Stepping back a bit, as an analyst of this war and of war in general, what, what have you learnt over the past two years that's new to you? But also, if I can be slightly cheeky, what do you think you might have got wrong? Well, it's better to start with what, 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 what I get wrong, because that's what you learn from. I, have to say, I think I've got quite a bit right, but I certainly, like many others, including most Ukrainians, found it hard to imagine that the invasion would take place in the first place. By the time it did take place, I thought it was much more likely than I had done before. But I was still surprised, partly because I just couldn't see how Russia could subjugate Ukraine. That's still my view. So I think I was wrong, but for the right reasons. It was a foolish thing to do from Russia's point of view. I think I got too optimistic on Ukraine's behalf in August, September 2022, not because the Ukrainians weren't doing well, but because I think it was a point where Putin had a choice about whether to double down, which is the route he took, or, or whether to accept the limitations on the military operation and look for a way out. So when the, uh, and the mobilisation, when it came in late September 22, was pretty chaotic. So I think it took a while to adjust to the reality that the Russians were in for the long term. But I think I picked up pretty quickly that Putin had boxed himself in with his annexations, and that was going to make the war very difficult to stop. So I think I was pretty cautious about the counteroffensive beforehand. You have to say that the Ukrainians' chances is what they're hoping to do, but I was looking at something I wrote at the time, saying it was being looked forward to with a mixture of apprehension and hope, and I think that was right. I guess the, the other thing is that, although, like most people, I assumed that at the end of this year it could get difficult, I didn't imagine that Congress would sit on its hands for so long, and certainly... That made me much more pessimistic and sort of slightly veering back again. I mean, I think the stuff on drone warfare is fascinating. 
And I think what's interesting is the way we always knew drones would be important, but the the move away from just thinking about these super capable drones to highly expendable, pretty cheap drones produced in their tens of thousands. I think that's one of the most interesting things to have watched. But basically, my approach to these things is pretty political. I, 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 my interest is in how these things are viewed by policymakers, and inevitably this means Putin. And we spend an awful lot of time trying to work out what the hell's going on in this man's mind, which is a very difficult thing to judge. I think I feel I've got more, the, more of a measure of him now than I did two and a half years ago. And it's not a particularly optimistic picture. But I think the danger for, for military analysts, I don't really see myself in, quite in those terms, is to forget the political context. And that view of how to, to follow a war uh, seems to me to be vindicated in this case. The, the war, wars can end with great battles and, and decisive breakthroughs, but they can also end with, with somebody deciding that they need to get out of it. Just quickly before we finish then, you said you think you've got a better measure of Putin after the past two and a half years. How, how so? Well, for the first, I think in a way it was apparent before, but it got clouded by all this stuff on NATO enlargement and it was really defensive move against what the West was doing. Just how ideological, almost religious, the thing that he has about Ukraine is. It's almost as if the idea of an independent Ukraine is in the front and that without Ukraine, Russia is not complete. Uh, and, the, and the civilizational aspects of this, that Russia now represents a form of civilization that, that, that's under threat from the decadent West. I think these elements, which a lot of international relations scholars and so on find it very difficult to get their heads round because they don't seem that important, are actually really critical. Secondly, one of the reasons I didn't expect Putin to, to launch an invasion is that his use force quite effectively in the past He's taken risks, but the pretty calculated risks with Chechnya and Georgia, Crimea, Syria, and so on. He's limited his liabilities quite effectively. And I think he, that's what he thought he was going to do this time. And he still remains quite a cautious decision maker. I mean, it took him time before the full scale mobilization was authorized. He has to be persuaded. He's loyal to the people around him who are loyal to him. So. There's a tendency to describe him as, as a crazy person. I think he's got, to my mind, a pretty deranged worldview, but it's coherent and consistent in his terms. So I, I spend a lot more time just reading what he says. You know, I, I, I don't think he's hiding an awful lot when he speaks. Lawrence, is there anything we haven't spoken about that you think is important to mention or important for our listeners to hear? I think we've covered a lot. Thank you so much for your time. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To support our work and stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do please refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And leave us a review, as it really does help others find the show. Please also share it with those who may not know we exist. As the disinformation war ramps up, we are relying on your support more than ever. You also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. You can also contact us directly on X, formerly known as Twitter. You can find our handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Giles Gear, Rachel Porter. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.